This interview is being conducted on April 18, 2006 at Niles Public Library in Niles, Illinois. My name is Kate Wallachy. I am speaking with Mr. Paul Schneller. Mr. Schneller was born on August 17, 1927 in Calumet, Michigan and now lives in Niles, Illinois. Mr. Schneller learned of the Veterans History Project through a visit to the library. He has kindly consented to be interviewed for the project. Here is his story. So you can start <coughs> wherever you want. Uh, first of all, I didn't realize I had forgotten so much. And then when I started thinking about it, I remembered more than I thought. So it's a good thing for an old person to recall. <laughs> right, ancient. Right. Mm -hmm. I assume you will edit some of this because... Yeah, well, right? you know. Okay. If you don't want us to tell you anything, oh, no. then we, we hide age. it. <laughs> yeah, shh, it's a secret. <laughs> uh, what I'm going to do is tell you what happened and uh, the influences it had on me directly and on my children. And then, since I became a teacher for most of my life, all my teachers. And I'll end with a very interesting thing about Arlington Cemetery and my first cousin, who married a Marine. So it will be washed in the Marine Corps, as you say. I enlisted, uh, the war was over, but it was still on. And I was a senior in high school in 1948, so I, I enlisted because my uh, person of interest was my cousin who married a Marine. And he was a big, tall Marine, about six foot five. And he's from the Mize family, and if you know your sports, his uh, cousin was Johnny Mize, the first baseman on the New York Yankees. So that's kind of a connection. Uh, Marines were being recruited still for both the cleaning up of the war, as you call a war of occupation. It's really the occupation always comes after. We are still in areas of occupation mm -hmm. since I was in the service. So this is not a new idea, it's an old one, and it's because some of the losers are poor. They're poor sports. They will not <laughs> accept that they lost. And they're opportunists that see a chance to blossom in a particular field. So I was sent to Paris Island, South Carolina, to the boot camp. I passed my physical. And uh, the first physical is in Chicago if you're going west, east to Paris Island. If you're going west past the Mississippi, you go to San Diego. And uh, the word boot means a, a boot, mm -hmm. a boot camp. So when the Corps was founded and when soldiers uh, had to live in the field, they wore boots, leather ones if they were high enough, or they were wrapped. Uh, various kinds of leathers, things like that, to keep their feet, and in uh, areas of uh, what we call beach sand, to keep the beach sand out of his feet. And then if they were horses. My dad, just to reference this, I didn't bring pictures of him, he was a military policeman in the First World War. And I have a picture of him with his squad, and there he's standing on the end with the boots on. So boot camp is an introduction to a life, okay? The, the first thing that I, I can talk about here, because it all fits, is orientation and deorientation. And that's the first two weeks when you go down there. And the deorientation is to separate all your family and friends and ideas and behaviors, because you're going to become a Marine. And that's, for a lot of people, very difficult more so even today. And uh, it's the first week of training, and you have medical and dental exams. You have uh, issue clothing and uh, M1 rifle, which follows you everywhere. Okay. And then you uh, say a little prayer. To, I'll read that to you in a minute. <laughs> and uh, you form, at that first period of two or three days, platoons. That's a platoon. This is my platoon. 
and uh, you then, uh, I suspect, are told, that's, I don't know why I got the note, but that the British in 1948 were still rationing bread, mm -hmm. and they were still rationing clothes up till 49. So while I didn't get into the fighting, thank my mother said thank you, uh, I still got into the field. Okay. And I uh, had some interesting things. Uh, what we did in the first two weeks was we marched and drilled close order and what they call length ones, two feet, two uh, miles and three. And uh, we uh, had calisthenics every morning before breakfast on the main parade ground. And the uh, Marine Band was there to play live music. And a model stood up on a post and did all the exercises you had to do. How did they pick that person? Uh, I imagine he was a model of calisthenics. Uh. <laughs> There's no doubt he's a professor of calisthenics someday. Because <laughs> he had a natural, he had the greatest moves from one to the next. So I thought, well, another guy knows what he's doing. And then, <laughs> and then we would march and we would sing and we would sing the Marine Corps hymn. And every Marine has to learn this by heart. Mm -hmm. And uh, I will start my talk eventually on what I did with the lines from here. Because the Marines have a esprit de corps that changes them from the nice, comfortable life they were in to a terrible life, just dreadful. I mean, because death is not pleasant. And you know, you gotta go from my mother and her nice attitude to my sergeant saying, you got to kill her. And it's just, it's, it's real dichotomy, you know. So, uh, we were told about the washouts. This is the first three days. That many of you will not make it, even if you want to be in the Corps. And the dropout rate is uh, about 18% of the recruits. And then I'll tell you a story about one so of them. So where did they end up if they dropped out? Well, they were given uh, a discharge based on medical advice from the doctor, psychiatrist, or uh, the regular doctor. They found mm -hmm. something wrong with the person, maybe one eye or this or something here, and it he would be a danger to the squad that he's in need of supporting. The weakest link is the weakest link, mm -hmm. and everybody in the military knows about it. So it's nothing personal. It's got nothing to do with what you would say is a political correctness or multiculturalism. It's survival of the fittest. Okay. So uh, they tell you about it, and they'll tell you why. It may be that we cannot use you. You do not like it, or you fail, something like that. We have, I think I've got some of the marks somewhere, but on the cards, because they're watching you all the time. And so they uh, then say, all right, you're going in this platoon. And we, they say, we're going to build muscles and confidence. Some days confidence and muscles, but back and forth. And uh, we build the esprit de corps. We build into the training uh, a spirit about comradeship, being a band of brothers. What does that really mean besides just talking? What does it mean when they're shooting at you? Things like that. Longer marches, they keep increasing, and re recruits must learn to sing this. So, Marine Corps, yeah. And they're all singing that. Now, when you see it in the movies, they have these little talking games like rapping. That's okay. And we did a lot of that, but that's, that doesn't build the spirit of course. Then we have lectures. The Pardon? Only the singing does yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. It does. There, I'll tell you why. But it, <laughs> lectures about the Marines and history. And so one of the things they very cleverly do, they weave in human values based on former Marines who did really interesting things. And they start that from the very beginning and uh, gets them in a lot of trouble with newspaper people. Uh, the oldest service we have a big, big birthday party every year, November the 10th, because it was the oldest service established in 1775. Okay. 
Now, I want to talk about the reference to the first two lines, so you get a little esprit de corps. very good. Yes. From the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. Okay? Yeah. Are those just words? Those are, they're not. They are shores of Tripoli. So, that's Libya today. So when Jefferson was president, this took place. And Jefferson is a little toward the left in terms of modern days. And no wars, no wars of aggression, no fights, just talk and diplomatic. So when the Barbary pirates started taking our word trade merchants and holding them for ransom, killing them when necessary, and making them slaves until you paid tribute. And the French sent a letter that, you know, you ought to do it too. That encouraged the Barbary pirates to do more. So, as you can imagine, Jefferson had to change his mind. So he de recommissioned 10 ships that he had put in mothballs and was listening to people who were going to say, this is what we can do about it. Diplomacy wouldn't work. The man was the Shah of Tripoli. All he wanted was money for his life. They don't have natural wealth in those countries. The, war, the ground is very inhospitable to farming. So steal and fight. So uh, the, a guy came in, and Eaton, his name is, and he was an army officer, and he had this idea. Not too many people liked it, but he says, let him go over there and take some Marines with him. And he says, we'll recruit some other people. And he says, then like Rommel, well, he didn't, I said Rommel, I'll march from Egypt along the North African coast to where the pirates are. And he collected Greek mercenaries who are wonderful fighters, by the way. Hitler will tell you that and uh, some Arab cavalry who are not trained, but who see an opportunity to make some money, and his little Marines. You know, he only had a couple of squads. And they went, and they went left, and when they got to the city of Darren, I think it was, uh, here was the Shaw, and he left for another place and told his men to fight off the Americans. Uh, it didn't work, the Americans stormed the place, they had artillery, and the Navy bombed it, and everybody in the city ran. And they went in and went up and raised the flag on the shores of Tripoli. So the song now means something to every Marine. There were real Marines, and they were in a real battle. And I, I, I even think I wrote down how many survived. They, they did a pretty good job in terms of numbers. Oh, let's see. Now, this is Montezuma, that's the next one coming up. So anyway, uh, what happened was the Arabs were upset, they didn't know what to do. Jefferson sent a diplomat over there, and then he redid everything like it was before. But that's the way it works. And so uh, they decided not to pick on America anymore anyway. <laughs> so. That's, uh, let's see, yeah, yeah. Continue uh, reducing civilian life things. And so you see in this first story a difference. You see a president who is a wonderful person with a flaw in the reality of leading and supporting a country. And he's one of my favorite persons, but he was wrong on this, okay? Now, uh, adding marine uh, philosophy and physical activities every day. So they're working on and so then we talk about that and everybody, we have what we call training sheds and when the flag is up and we can't drill because it's too hot, then we go into the training sheds and we hear different people talk. This is one of them that I heard. Now the next one was the halls of Montezuma. Where is the hall of Montezuma? Montezuma was the Aztec 
emperor or two of them, and he lived in this palace. And the Americans were being uh, put in a very, very awkward position because of the West taking away New Mexico and so on. So uh, they sent Scott with the army and a contingent of Marines again. Smallest little group, but the best trained. So off they go, and they get to Mexico City, and they attack this palace. And I wish I could pronounce it. What's it called? Uh, I got it here. Capitapatic. I don't know. If I ever do it serious, I better look it up. But anyway. So they went, they landed on Vera Cruz, they went across the state of Florida, and when the castle fell, the insurrectionists ran. They took away. And the Americans put up the flag there, took Mexico City, and then eventually they left. Uh, they left, I got a little note here, they left, and they uh, eventually went back into civilian life. So that's the encounter with Mexico in that period. There are others. The, the, the Marines have been involved over a hundred and some landings like this. They're sort of the policemen of the world, for good or bad. Now, uh, let's see, we'll skip over here to the qualifying. Oh, we had one more. I want to do this one later. I think I'm do it. Oh, boy. Here are the training days for the Marines, okay, which I was an uh, instructor eventually in. And so you go through the basics, mental, physical, training schedule, hardness. Weeks one and two, you spend leaving part of yourself away and taking on a new self. Okay. Then a week three and four culminates in those first two weeks being put together like if you were a dancer for the show. You, put, you actually do it and practice it. And each time you do it, you add a burden on someone. And so by the end of the second week, certainly the third, 18% of the fellows are given a release. And they've had their head all shaven, and they go home. And to them, they're, some like it. They, don't, they didn't want to go. Even though they enlisted, they didn't know what they were getting into. Because the Marines are not drafting like the Army was. They were still getting people. So uh, then the mental test came. I had one. I remember all the physical ones. You had to do so many sit-ups. You had to run this way, and then you had to come in and take an IQ test. Did you have to do it all in the same, in the same day? or in the No, day? in the week. It was a, it was a week. week. Yeah, oh, they were, every week got tougher. And then weeks five and six, you went to the rifle range. And that's where I ended up an instructor. But when we went through it, uh, we had uh, the thing that uh, you call snapping in, or grass period, where you just use the rifle, and you, got, you sleep with it at a time, and you know how to put on the belts and all of that. And you'll see why in a minute. Uh, then you actually go on the firing line. That's You use live ammunition, and on the last day of that, you fire for qualification. And if you don't qualify, you are never put in a platoon that's uh, going to be involved in shooting. Cause so you have to be... You have to be every involved. Marine that's in there is a marksman. Mm -hmm. I am too. And you could be counted on to protect other people. That, that's their philosophy. You know. So you can say the rifle is the dividing device of the Marines. Okay, so that we'll see later on. So, uh, <clears throat> you could say that. Yeah. <laughs> yes, because <laughs> I was there. <laughs> I went through it and I taught it, so I did both. So week seven and eight is warrior week, and that's where you start getting into the actual physical dimensions of it, and they, you have best uh, equipment that you can do. You wear helmets and you do all that, and it's, uh, it's rough. And you, if you make it a game, it's <laughs> You can get away. You can get, pretend you're playing basketball or something, you know. And then uh, week seven and eight, that's Warrior Week. Week nine and ten, return to the rifle range for advanced training, shooting at moving targets, shooting with limited lights, all of that. And uh, 
and then you get to expand your knowledge and not skill, but awareness of weapons. You, you get to fire a Browning automatic rifle, which is a machine gun, and you just squirt it just to feel it, because you're not going to be trained for that, because you may be assigned a cook, so they're not going to waste that training. The basic training is bayonet and rifle. That's what you've got to master. And then you get ready. Oh, just think. Mm. Got a little bit of a problem. Fine. Okay, now. Not nearly running. What they're doing as they go camp, and I got involved with some of it later because of things I would do. And uh, by the twelfth week, you are going to be sent to an advanced station. And so what the Marines try to do is, like a lot of colleges, tell you a little bit about chemistry, tell you a little bit about biology, and you get an idea of what you might want to do. I ended up being a weapons specialist. I never had a weapon in my life. My mother wouldn't let me have a BB gun. So this is, you see. So, and they, they stress the family values in this last thing. And then they have, I wrote down some of the things I remember. Uh, pilots, technicians, military police, special forces, flamethrowers, communication. That's the... Flamethrowers? The, huh? Oh yeah, they have. They, uh, the, when they got to Japan, uh, the Japanese would not give up. And they'd stay buried in their state, and the, and the Marines would get, are you there, you get shot. So they, they developed this machine that they carried all the petroleum that was the mix for the flame, and then a big hose with a nozzle, and then they fire heavily, and then the guy would go up to the, and turn on the flame. And it did two things. It burned almost everybody to death and or it withdrew all the oxygen and they strangled because they were built that way. Japanese, it was dishonored to, to, right. to, and so the flame, so I, I figured they saw a movie and they maybe saw this, I don't know. And then communication, and that's really kind of cute here. This, let me tell you the story now. This is the Navajo code breakers. So when they saw what they were dealing with, with the Japanese, they made an adjustment and they said, go out and recruit. And so they all went out to the Window Rock Reservation. Now it's funny, I go back there 40 years later as a consultant on reading. <laughs> so the, the uh, Navajos had two conditions. They had to be healthy enough to become a Marine. And they had to know English and Navajo fluently. No time to write it down. They had to do instant translation. So the Marines took these people, and where's I have a picture on here. here. Here's basically the code for the Marines was based on. Urgent message could be sent and received without time-consuming process of encoding and decoding. Not only is that time-consuming, you've got to be in perfect conditions and you can misquote, mm -hmm. and, and that's terrible. The Navajo simply read the message they got from the commanding officer. They read it in English and he listened, send it. And then he'd go down and send it in, he'd translate on the machine, the, the radio. And the guy at the other end knew exactly what it meant. He didn't have to decode it. And that's fabulous. It saved so many lives you can't believe it. And that's the code breaker. So people there that have a language are looked upon as a valuable link in the marine chain. You know German? I can tell you the German thing in the famous battle. A guy pulled a Sergeant York because he spoke perfect German. And he got up there and he yelled in German. So everybody was identified for having skill, having things that the Marines could draw on, either in revolts, in insurrections, or in war, whatever it was. And then it was, there were classes when we used to argue back and forth. And that. Uh, divisions on land and sea, the second marine division, you can go into the amphibian group, you can uh, be a uh, guard for the councils and the embassies, you can do duty, duty on a naval vessel, on a carrier, they're all marines.
I've got a picture in my archives of the USS Kearsarge in the Civil War with the Union services, and here's a picture of the 12 Marines that are assigned to that ship. Now, where I live in Upper Michigan, and I go through Kearsarge, there's a ship there called the USS Kearsarge. And it was built by the Works Project Administration in the 30s. <laughs> it's just crazy. Then uh, armored vehicles and tanks, all of that. Those are where you go to. Now, one of the talks I got to tell you a little bit about, Sergeant Neely had been in China maybe eight years in the 30s. And China duty was among the best, was the best in a way. People liked the Marines. They respected them. They had great horses. They looked great. They had their boots polished. And they would change the guard like the British. And in Peking, the capital, uh, they were uh, noted for their ponies. They were so well groomed and all of that. So he said, how much he enjoyed it. He taught me about the Chinese people. I was in the group. You know. And then uh, the thing that's interesting, he told me about Shirley Temple. Now, Shirley Temple was the biggest box office attraction in Hollywood in the 30s. And uh, when her movie played any place, Shanghai, Peking, Tianjin, a line would form up all the way around the bluff. This is what he told me. He said they were mesmerized by Shirley Temple. And I said, I talked to him, I said, but they threw their girl babies in the river. He said, not a girl like Shirley Temple. Because <laughs> <laughs> they were thrown the work, the ones that girls that were no good, had no value. And I said, I don't. If they could have tap dance. I, I said, that's your trick. But she could sing, she could tap dance, she had a great thing. They, they used to have people translate, you know, in the movie. So I always thought about that. So that's consulate duty. And some of them like that. They go in the consulate work. They are all over the world. And uh, they're bodyguards. And my Uncle Mac, he was a bodyguard for Roosevelt on the last tour that Roosevelt took in the, what, the western part of the country. Okay, now the last week in the Marines, and then we'll get into what I did. Our platoon assembled for the last time, began telling recruits their new assignments. That's a big thing. So you do whatever you do, and then late in the day you assemble at the main barracks, you're out of the way, and they say, uh, all right, uh, so and so and so and so, and they may call off 15, 20 names, and you are to report. So and so. Here's your furlough, and now you will report when you come back. I have a 10 day furlough or something. To you, this, and they give them an address, each one, and off they go. And then I am, because I can type, they had me typing in the day at the headquarters. And that's the first time I saw uh, a woman Marine was there. They were in the headquarters. So I came in and typed. And I did that. Second night, we all gathered again, line up calls off another group. They go two places, Cherry Point, North Carolina, which is air, and then uh, we went to Georgia and worked with uh, rangers who were army units that they worked with and got an idea. And some went to the headquarters. Third night, there's seven of us left. And I figured, well, tonight I'll, I'll be going now. And they called everybody else, and there I am. What do I do? They, they don't want me? What is it? And I said, I remember I talked to the guy. Uh, when will I get my order, sir? Uh, you won't. You're staying here. Paris Island. You've been assigned to Paris Island's Weapon Training Command. That was it. So <laughs> I got the furlough. I went home. And then I came back and began my work with uh, an interesting. So it's still 1946, huh? Still, oh, it's just the fall. Yeah. This picture was taken in uh, 46. Oh, October. But anyway, when I tell you about my duties and what I did, you have a chance to reflect back on the uh, boot camp because they're all tied together. Because uh, I think when I finish today, you have a different understanding of a rifle. 
Okay? I'm all for a different understanding yeah. of a rifle. You don't have to have it, you just have to understand yeah. it and yeah. uh, support people that have to use it. All right, then we have grass week, and this leads, of course, to the rifle range. So, rifle range. This would be after you come back from your furlough now, and you've gone, you've made it, you're going to be a Marine, you've got a thing on your head, and, and you're now. <laughs> you've got a thing on your head? Yeah, right. The, the, the signia of the Marines. Oh. The globe. Okay, so. <laughs> the thing on your They won't let you head. have it. They won't let you have it until you get one. That means. They put those on for the picture and took them off after the picture. Because <laughs> you're still a recruit. You may not be a Marine. You don't get to wear that until you're a Marine. They have all these little things, kid. So anyway, hours of instruction uh, begin in the first week with the uh, weapon. And I'm going to read a little thing they put on you. All the recruits, I'm now an, an instructor. Okay. I came back from my furlough. Here I am. And I'm basically an apprentice. I'm going through with an experienced instructor or coach, one of the two. My rifle. And then we have not say it, we say it, and then we sing. This is my rifle. These are, there, there are many like it, but this one is mine. My rifle is my best friend. It is my life. I must master it as I master my life. My rifle without me is useless. Without my rifle, I am useless. I must fire my rifle true. I shoot him before he shoots me. I changed that to enemy. I didn't like the way it was so. And we all had that option to make changes. So I must shoot my enemy before he shoots me. And you're going to stab him. So we try to say that this white rifle is different and it's an M1 and it's uh, capable of firing. Uh, I think the one I had was seven bullets, 30 caliber. And is it working yet? It's still working. All I'm right. just holding it down. It's been All right. Funny so way. the first thing we do, we get them on what they call the green reek. The green reek is in front of the big rifle range and it's all grass and it's called snapping in where we try to get them to be as comfortable with a rifle as they are at anything they'll ever have in their life. And so we take out the firing pin in case they accidentally get a bullet and it fires. Never been a Marine killed in the history of the rifle range. That's another interesting thing. So weapon handling, that's the first thing. Uh, treat weapons, got enough time? Yeah, yeah, yeah I guess so. Yeah. I'm just making sure it's still Treat working. weapons as if they were loaded. So I still do it. I say, treat it as if it's loaded. You won't fool around. Keep your fingers off the trigger. Keep your weapons on safety. There's a safety button. And never point a weapon unless you intend to use it. And we, every Marine's got to master that. And if we see one being violated, he gets, he got to duck walk. He got to do, you know, until he learns. He can never do it. He'll say, ha, ha, ha. And duck walk? That's you walk like a duck. Uh, I can't how do, do you walk like I a can't, duck? I can't do it anymore. I can't get down like this. And you have to walk. Oh, yeah. Oh, that would hurt. Yeah. So that's one of the punishments. There's all kinds of yeah. other yeah. <laughs> I see. So You've I, got I, track. Then. Yeah. Uh, then you have an introduction to marine marksmanship. Now, the first time I did it, another guy did it, because I'm just learning. And then there's an introduction to the fundamentals of marksmanship. And uh, what's interesting, we had these sheds like this. They were open air on three sides. They had a back and a bulletin board, and then just these steer, uh, uh, tiers of steps. Mm -hmm. And there's no back, so you had to sit, pay attention. Uh, introductory positions. You had sitting, you had sit and shoot. You had kneeling and shooting, standing and prone. You had four positions. Every Marine has to learn how to shoot as a marksman at all those things. The common elements and we would, and then, you know, this is, this goes on and on day after day. And then relaxing your muscles if you're going to fire. You've got to learn to relax your muscles, okay. like, like athletes do today, you see. There are ways to do it. 
Uh, use the bones of your body to support your body and your rifle, not your muscle. So we're, so I am being taught at the same time they're telling the people that if you got a guy using his muscles, he, that's not what you're doing. You're using the bones in here to support that rifle. Okay, so, and you, you people don't know that. You have to say, here, move physically. And in the beginning we have two coaches, I'm sorry, we have one coach for every two students the first week. That's how tough it is. Ah, firing and uh, your body. Then firing at the natural point of an aim. So you're aiming, and how do you aim? And the position where the rifle sight comes into focus with your eye and the target. And you got to you practice to do that. We got guys shooting with the wrong eye, and you know, so it's, it's a lot of work. It's one week of just doing that. Shooting with the wrong eye. That's right. When uh, when uh, here's nod and a jerk, it's at the time to relax, warm up. So if we can't get a guy to understand what we're trying to get him to do, then we make him run or duck walk <laughs> to get the blood going through. And when you're shooting, you can't even eat candy bars because of the sugar rush. Yeah. You're going to see why in a minute. Then we have zeroing in, and that's where you get ready to get your rifle to be as accurate as you can. And uh, this is adjusting the rifle for all of those positions. Now, how do you do that? You have straps, leather straps on the rifle. And when you're going to sit down and fire, then you put your leg here like this, and you put your hand here, and you put the strap, the belt around here. You gotta measure the distance here, and then the belt, and then when you go by them, I just, he's aiming there, and I go like that, and he moves. That means he's wired up right. Not the muscles, the bones. You gotta keep doing that and doing that. <laughs> it's interesting. So anyway, uh, adjusting the rifle to the individual recruit's arm length, arm strength, and hand strength. It's got three things there that contribute to that perfect shooting. Adjusting for wind and sun, weather, rain comes later. And that's, of course, a, uh, I had a wind chart. I don't have it anymore. But on the end of the rifle range, when the flags are blowing, you've got to take the angle and figure out how much you have to change the rifle for 500 yards. Because if you don't, if you don't compensate, compensate for the wind, you won't hit your target, okay. even if you're a marksman. So we have a thing we call brass, B-R-A-S-S, -S, dash F. And that means you breathe, so we teach breathing. Okay. Then relax, so you get your breath in there, and then you start to let the tension come out of your hands or whatever, it is. like you see them shooting basketball players. It's all the same thing, ballerinas. You know. Aim, you aim, and you know there's a way of aiming. You have to know what you're shooting at, and you shoot, you stop, and then you squeeze the trigger. You never pull the trigger, you squeeze it. And so, as a coach, you watch each recruit, and they, they all make mistakes, left and right, and so you gotta just keep doing it. And then if they're wrong, we gotta have them miss a day, and if they miss more than three, they gotta go to another platoon that's coming, because they need more practice. So the Marines taught me as a teacher, and I said, holding kids back recycling them, okay, because they could be recycled. And then the uh, thing was a follow-through that I thought was the hardest thing to teach. And the follow-through is the speed of the bullet coming out of the barrel of the rifle is known. And if you don't follow through, see, you come down, you fire, and it goes, and you, as that bullet leaves, it's influenced to go in a little different direction. And so you've got to watch. That's the hardest thing to detect, because it happens like that. So I got to the point where I started putting my finger, like the guy in tennis, when he puts his finger on the net. Because he's wired up, so he can, he's tired up, you know, because we wouldn't get there. Now here's <laughs> the rifle range, okay? Uh, they fire... Um, Five rounds at a target of 40 feet before they start the shooting of the real thing. And that is 
to get them, just to be like in this room, where they get live ammunition, and then it's the last thing to get them to understand how they can understand themselves, because they're not going to have a coach in the field. So we teach them to study the scatter. And the scatter means you, you have 10, I don't know what, how many you are doing now, on this target, and if they're all in the black, oh, it's beautiful. If there's one here, and there's a bullet here, and there's a bullet here, and there's a bullet missing, we got a problem. This guy's all over the place. He hasn't learned what he was supposed to learn. So if the guy shoots and he hits everything, but it's a cluster down here, that's beautiful. He's got a problem orienting himself to the target, but his mechanics are beautiful. So see how much there is to this? So, uh, let's see, the thing that you ought to know about what I had to do there, we had to keep these log books. And the log book, you know, just had the card, the guy's card. So, how did he do here, how did he do here, and you're checking them off. And nobody's looked at more carefully than the Marine Corps rifle range people. God, they really do it. And when I went through as a recruit, I was very good. And when I got sent to the school, I said to the fellow one day, when I could talk, I was a Marine. You can't talk till you're a Marine. You just can't have a talk. <laughs> you can't talk at Until all? You, or you no, just can't nothing. talk to somebody ahead of you or what? You just don't talk. Like a monk, then. That's right, like a monk. And when you get your Marine Corps thing, then you can talk. I can go up to you and say, sir, how did I, I don't think you should go up to me and say, sir. <laughs> <laughs> How did you get uh, this job? He said, oh, you were easy. I said, I was. He said, you looked at all your records. As I'm talking about a record now. And he said, you did everything the way the Marine Corps teaches. I said, he says, that means you don't have one bad habit. And that's the kind of people we want using rifles. Isn't that interesting? So anyway. That's how you ended up there, not having any bad I d habits. I didn't have any habits. Yeah. My mother wouldn't let me use a gun. You ended so up that, teaching people because you'd never know I never do. Before. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. But then you think about it and you say, the guy's right. Yeah. That is right. So anyway, now uh, they are uh, required to keep uh, their own records. The coaches keep records. And that is shared with the drill instructor. And uh, we have records on sitting, on kneeling, standing, and prone. And those are all different lengths. In other words, you, uh, a guy can be very good at co uh, close, but uh, I think I had the distances here. Oh, yeah, here. Uh, sh shooting at 200 yards, sitting, standing, kneeling at 200 yards, standing at 200 yards, sitting at 300 yards, prone at 500, 300, and then prone at 500 yards. And the Marines are the only soldiers in the world that require their soldiers to shoot and pass marksmanship at 500 yards. Nobody else. It's unique. And uh, that's a quarter of a mile. And that, you've got to have all the parts working right. I'm telling you. And then, of course, the targets are marked so that when you do shoot, I, I wonder if I go into that here. I'm sure I know. So anyway, here we are now on the, the rifle range, and those are the distances. And my first recruit, first one, I remember this day, <laughs> it comes in, and we've got 50 positions at the first burn. The burn is a, the land that they put up so the bullets will never hit men in the trenches. And then they run the targets. And so I put them up, and my coach is right next to me. And I say, oh, uh, begin shooting. And every time he shoots, the Maggie's Bloomer show, that's a red uh, thing that shows he's got nothing. And they wave it back and forth. And so, and then the guy that's my supervisor comes over, he says, stop him a minute and watch him. 
So then uh, I figured I would see if he was breathing right. You notice that difference. And I thought I got it straight, and I put him there, and he did another set, and he hit the target. Now that's big progress. So then I looked for something else, and then he had another problem. And uh, when I was done, he got all his bullets on the target, and I saw the guy who was watching me go. <laughs> my first one. <laughs> so I took a guy who couldn't hit the target. That's my first one, and I got him to hit it. And then, of course, then we walk, and that means do this again with him next time he's here, and it will be the next day. So you see how the charts work back and forth? So anyway, let's go back to this and tell you a story about Mark Fincher and the Marines. This is a sad story to tell because so many people were killed, but it's an important story if you're an instructor to know. The Marines in 1917 were sent to France, but Marshal Foch, the Supreme uh, General, did not feel confident with them. They had no background. He didn't know about their training. You know. So he put them in a position of what they call a reserve. And the real people up ahead were the French had been fighting for three years in the trenches. And Ludendorff, the German general, knew that if he's going to win the war, he had to do it now before these millions of Americans come. And then he really believed it after this battle. So the Battle of Bella Wood was getting ready. Bella, it depend, you pronounce it Bella if you're Anglican, Bello if you're French. So there's two of it. And that's a town. And right off the town is the, is the, the front, but there's a woods, the low woods, and the beautiful trees. You ought to see the before and after pictures of that place. So I, I got the date down here uh, somewhere. And I may, be, I may be able to tell, it doesn't really matter, it was June lines. And there's a road going from the uh, battleground area in the woods right to Paris. And first of all, the Marines are told to go up there and fill in the breakthrough. That's the thing you really are always afraid of. So the French general says, that's all I got. Send them up. And the Marine Force Brigade goes up. And as they're going, they see all the refugees coming back. Then the French soldiers that are wounded and being taken off the field. So they have this thing. And the French general said, we're going, retreating, come and retreat. And the guy said, hell, that's not why we came here though. You know, we're going to fight. I mean, that's a famous quote that this guy made. And uh, the, they had one skill that they were the only ones that had. And the rifle they had was the Springfield, the most accurate rifle, 1903, for shooting at distance. And they all were marksmen, everyone, they wouldn't be there. And so they were told to align themselves along the ridge of the road up ahead with the turn so that if they could see the Germans coming, they could start sniping at them. Now, nobody in warfare up to then used any guns beyond 200 yards. And what you did was you aimed at a point and you sent rockets and um, what we eventually came to call a bazooka, rocket uh, devices on a rifle. And uh, mortars, you had mortars. And you pulverized an area. We call it saturation bombing now, where nothing is left. There's not a tree standing. And the American guy thought, that's not what we are doing. So he gave him the order to shoot. So the Germans are coming. They know the Americans are way a couple of miles down or something. At 800 yards, the, Amer the American Marines start firing. Now that's a problem even hearing the bullet. And as the Germans are walking along, the guy goes down. And then the guy drops over here. And then another one drops over here. And the Marines are picking them off at 800 yards. That's over a quarter of a mile. And the, the, the runner goes back and he tells the commanding officer, he, he says, they must have, everybody must have a machine gun over there. 
and they're making these lucky. You know, you hold that up and cute. And, uh, it wasn't that, it was a straight line, bullet down the right. And the Germans stop. So that's the first time. And then they stop. And what you do when a group stops, you try to counterattack. And so the Marines did a counterattack, but they were stopped. Then they did it again, and they broke through. So they broke through and went all the way through the woods. And a reporter from the Chicago Tribune went with him. And he got wounded, and he write a communique that the censors didn't censor. And this is the beginning of the hostility between the Marines and everybody else. He wrote it as if the Marines were the only people in the battle. And the French that were over here, they were supporting. And the Brit not the British, but the uh, American army, these were all supporting. The Marines were the one that had the long rifles and got across first. So that, that's the beginning of some of the natural dislike that the branches have for each other. So I got the quote from, uh, from uh, let's see, the Major General Fauch, and he said, this battle of Bella Wood is the cradle of the success and the victory, because it started the counter movement that everybody then got involved in. And the Marines on their base, Take this out and turn. Bellawood Drive. So that is, in a sense, the biggest battle for its day. Now, Paro and there are other ones, the Imo Jimo and that. But the point was they named the road after it, and uh, this is the training base where I work. So there it is. It's there. It's in the history book. See how we're doing. Okay. okay. Yeah. Don't worry about it. Don't so uh, we tell that story, and uh, we tell them how important the rifle is, and that the people that are anti-rifle in this environment are wrong, and we have a story to tell about changing a war, and not in the dramatic terms of the news media but simply in the standards of war. The, Mer the Americans that were shooting at 800 yards were the first people in history to shoot beyond 200 yards. That's, that's quite a feat. So what they were in prone position with the belt here like this, and then the, the thing in here, and that rifle did not move. And all the guy had to do was just keep looking until someone walked in to his rifle range, and then he squeezed the trigger. In other words, you don't, you don't do that. You just keep watching them. And then uh, later on, I'll tell you about how we then get into motion shooting and all of that. But that, that's uh, an example that drives home a position of marksmanship that you might not want to agree with. You might be a deer hunter. Well, that's okay, but this is not, these are human beings who will shoot right back at you, and they're coming to kill you. So that's the part I don't like. Uh, I just, uh, so we got all the recruits, and then qualification day, it's Friday, and then they have to go out, and you can't help them at all. You just stand there, and they're your little babies, and they're shooting, and that's going to qualify them for what they can do as a Marine, and what they can't do. And they cannot go, for example, I saw a, a, a clip on the news from uh, Iraq, and there were six Marines on top of buildings. And you know, they're not supposed to be there. <laughs> supposed to be at the shores of that. But anyway, they're very well trained. And there's a guy in another place shooting. So he says, okay, con uh, sighting and then the guy goes over there and one guy watches and then another guy's telling another one this and then he's telling another one that they work as a team it's not oh it's a gun I'm mad at him it's nothing to do with that it's here is somebody that's shooting at us how can we eliminate him and then 
Each guy has a role to play. And then they, they execute. And that's where uh, I mentioned the fact that if you can't, say, uh, shoot at 800 yards, why would you be in that field? Because you're just giving away your position. And it would cost you your life. And that's basically what it is. So that was my little uh, thing that I did, and I did it over two days, and I had guys come up and do that. All right, that's the end of that, and we'll go to the next thing. Week nine. Week nine in the training was uh, on the rifle range yet, and so they're, they're recruits now in their ninth week. Now they're pretty good by now. They're really tough. So they march to the rifle range and they learn to fire at moving targets. And they had a plane come down to cause confusion. And so they'd walk into the plane, you know. That. You wear, you, you wear and try to fire using gas masks because the Germans used mustard gas in the First World War. So you had to use your gas mask and still look through the window and then shoot. So they had that training. That, that was scary. You couldn't breathe. The glass would fog up. Fire at limited light levels. So in, in maybe dawn or maybe uh, in the night when they were carrying the wounded off, they didn't do it in the day because the Germans would shoot at the corpsmen trying to get the people back to the hospital. So they had to do it at night. And at night, some Marines would go along to protect them with their rifle. Uh, you, uh, let's see, return and complete obstacle course. That was, you had to come back. See, they had a time on you when you did it originally. And that's in this area here. So that you have time here. Now the course is out here, but it doesn't matter, that's where it was. And so they got a before and after time. You got to go over the things and under the things and over the things. And uh, you have at one place live ammunition being shot at you. There's a machine gun in a crib so it can't go up and down. And you, get, you know what it means to go below fire. You had to do that. That's all psychology, feeling. Then we uh, had them uh, work with the BAR, and that was not to be killed, killed. but the BAR had three people. It was a, an automatic uh, machine gun with this leg like that. One guy carried the ammunition, one guy did the sighting and the firing, and another guy, who was the other one? There were three, and a BAR team. The shooter, oh, the fellow that put the, uh, the bullets in and all of that. They came in boxes and you had to put them in. And then you work with the hand grenades. Uh, you know, keep a safety ring on, as, and they would keep their safety ring on as a sign of graduation. Now, I want to say something about this returning to pit. That was very scary. And you have live grenades, which you are now going to learn to throw, because uh, Marines don't tell you anything they don't make you do. So you get the game, uh, you have this box of grenades. They're all live, but they got the safety in. So you have the recruit pick it up and then go over here. And then when you say, throw it, you tell them. But before you told them, this is interesting. Movie versions of grenades roll on the floor. And very often, people pick them up and throw them back. Now, way back, when I was training people, we say, throw it in a room or an area where it can bounce or wiggle off someplace or it go behind a corner or something so it can't be picked up and thrown back. They experimented with shorter phrases, uh, film, not film, I'm, I can't think of a war, with uh, shorter power things, but 10 seconds was about the best. And then what most of us did, we always said, keep it in your hand longer after you pull the, if you, if you can work up to that. So you pull it, and then you got 10 seconds. Or you can do it. 
one one thousand, two one thousand, three one thousand, throw it. Then by the time he gets it's only five, he can't pick it up and throw it back. He blow it back. So that's what the training does. It takes every one of these things that you issue and you have people go out there and go through it. So now let's see if I should I told you about things, all those things. All right, how we do we got Okay. Let me tell you about some of the things that relate to the culture of the people. The Marines work on philosophy every day in psychology, just like they do on the mechanics, which is interesting. And they try to bring what we call the esprit de corps, the, the attitude of a family in love with what they do. And it's a trick when you think you're killing people. And so you have to take exceptional pride and devotion to being good at whatever you do. You can always be good. You can always be a good this or a good that. And you've got to find a way of doing that. And the Marine does that. So the philosophy here is family and culture. Marine culture. That means you're free to change any word if you don't like it. So let me read Shakespeare. And this is one little passage. We few, and the Marines are the smallest of them, we happy few, we band of brothers, that's all we are together. For he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. But he never so vile, and that's so unwanted, so unloved, so living for no purpose. So you know, I know how bad it can be to be nobody. That's what Shakespeare, master at. This day shall be gentle, his condition. And gentlemen to England now, a bed, sleeping in. Englishmen, who are gentlemen sleeping, shall think themselves accursed they were not here. So you say, all right, uh, change the word discipline. And then, you know, when you do it, you say, is that something Shakespeare would do? He says, well, he said it's a problem today. You can't discipline anybody. You got all this multicultural stuff. So the, the point is, here's Shakespeare, and what I do is simply let them tell me, uh, could you change the word vile? And I wrote down some of the things to make sure. And then they all, they say, yeah, homeless people, ignoble people, oh, see what I got on here. Poor, lonesome, unpleasant, could be stinky. Today you're going to be somebody. Now you have to give your blood. But it's a way of making people think about actions that they have never thought about before. They say, for example, that most people that are bad, that get bad, are never aware of when they're doing what's so good and exciting, the consequences. Oh. So did you think that because you were teaching people uh, were you teaching both things at the same time yeah. that you were teaching people yeah. rifles? You were teaching them right. th the ideas behind yeah. the, the, the Marines. The students, like you had to, it would be hard to justify some. You had to, uh, for example, take the questions that they'd say, why, how come you, you guys are better than the DIs? The DIs got a tougher job. They yell and scream, what do you mean? <laughs> Go over there. We never do that coaching, they got all they can do to handle the weapons and all of that. And if we have somebody that starts acting up, guess who we tell? The drill instructor. Recruit number so-and-so. What's your age? All right, go here. And the favorite word we used was now. Now! Listen. Whatever it was. <laughs> and so the drill instructors, some of the better ones would come to part of the day. See, what they're doing is they're getting up with their recruits at the rifle at the weapons command, which is where I was, and they're saying, uh, 
Oh man, I got all this. We'll keep him, whatever it is. I'm not going to go. He'll march him out. And he'll come up in here, or be an instructor. Could be anybody, me, you know, one of them. And salute and say, I give you platoon 283 for weapons. And you take out the chart, and you go from there. And uh, so you act as a DI, but you're not. And that one of the things, we never yell like that. It just, that's, that was my nature. I never knew I would like teaching. That's what they taught me. I did like it. I was very good at it. And uh, let's see. Then you, that's uh, the philosophy of psychology, I suppose. And the training was also, I wrote down here, character. Boy, we worked on character a lot. Family values, we worked on that. And the family was the core. The squad, the platoon, it's us against them. You know, you know like, the, like the syndicate, <laughs> family. The core values were honor. You wouldn't, should not dishonor something that we honor. You should have the courage, even if you don't have the feeling that goes with it, you're scared, and then the commitment. Now let me tell you about that. Uh, one day I was in, uh, I was in boot camp again, and uh, we had um, beds one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then three down the middle because the pot belly stove was there. And we got up, the bugle blew, and brought everybody up, Captain. You know, they got sayings. Some you can say, some you can't. And so I got up, and I, said, and I, I look across, and here's my friend. I've been with him for a little over two weeks. And uh, he's like this, sitting on the bed. He was, he couldn't take anymore. He was shaking so much. And we all, remember they told us that the guys will break down, some will just walk away, and they got to be military police, have to take them away, and this guy's just shaking. And I tried to talk to him, I don't remember his name was, and uh, I, uh, I couldn't get through. So I told another fellow, I said, run out and get the cat. sergeant, you know, came running in. He says, okay, call the uh, clinic and nursing, whatever it was. And they came in the ambulance and took him away. He never saw him again. So I'm assuming that's where he snapped. He washed out. His nerves had reached the point where you couldn't, and they didn't have tranquilizers, as far as I remember. That would have only masked the problem. He was shaking terribly. Felt so sorry for him. So, uh, if we didn't tell him, see, friends are usually people who share similar traits regarding moral values and similar work ethic and etc. And that was an effect of that talk on washout. If you didn't have the background, if you didn't have whatever the family, the this, I can't blame you. We just we can't use you. And that's that's unfortunate, but it's necessary. And you you should be in the Marines to experience it, so you can critique it and talk about it. And I uh, I did that. Now. Let's talk about the social life. You want to do that for a minute? That's because why did I stay there? I had only a two-year enlistment. So, USO is a United Service Organization run by the people that live in the community to help the boys, the young boys. I was 18, who are <coughs> living in this <laughs> difficult environment, one you can honor and respect, but it's, it takes in <coughs> USO at U.S. owned community. So when I was a coach, then I was able to leave the base mm -hmm. and go to Buford. This is actually the way it is situated <coughs> in uh, reality. And Buford is up here. Mm -hmm. And so they had marine buses that would go <coughs> if enough people signed up on pretty much of a regular route. They take you in for five or six and they come back and get you around then. So you had an evening at the USO, or you could walk around and some guy try to pick up girls, and you could uh, whatever. You, you would know. never do that. No, <laughs> but anyway. So there was a music quiz. I'll tell you about that in a photo department. I learned to take pictures in the dark. Dances. There were sing along. They used to have this movie, and the bouncing balls go. We all sing along. I don't know if they do it yet after they. 
They had holiday dinners when they had a thing, and uh, it might be one of the churches, so it helped the volunteers. They had games and activities, a shuffleboard, all that. Uh, free rides, free tickets, like when I went to New York later, I got tickets to Broadway, and, and they were really great with the servicemen. Now, one night, I went with a friend of mine, and uh, this is cute, Friday night, and uh, they were having their musical quiz, you know, low up. so you'd take a seat, and they'd give you a little pad, and uh, so you number a one to ten, ding, 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 and then you sit there, then the girl would come up, and she'd say, all right, first quiz question, what is the name of that <coughs> song? What orchestra is playing it? Who's the performer? And then one other question was, <clears throat> let's see, name of the song, name of the performer, and what, maybe it'll come to me when I do this. So, so I go, I get all of those. And then they say, oh, the winner tonight is Private Schneller. He got them all right. <laughs> oh, I've got them all right. And so I went up and I got my prize. I, I don't remember what it was, but great honor. <laughs> uh, and then I went back and we did other things. <clears throat> I went next week, Friday night. I thought, ooh, this is fun. I do it again. I did it. I won again. <laughs> and I was having a good laugh and enjoying it. And this girl came over and she said, Brian Schneller, yeah. She said, we were just thinking. Ah, you winning all the time takes all the fun out of the game. <laughs> she says, how can you get all those songs and the singers and that? I said, I, my mother used to give me Blue Note, the magazine that came out on popular music. Mm -hmm. you, you remember it, Blue Note? And they had, the, 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 if you read that, you do all of this, you know. Jimmy Dorsey, band, oh, that's what it was, the band. It was the name of the song, Tangerine. Uh, the name of the singer, Helen O'Connell, and the band was Jimmy Dorsey. Yes, that was the three. And uh, <laughs> it was like falling off a lot because I had Blue Note from the day I was showing signs of interest in music. My aunt, a school teacher, bought the thing for me. So that, my little... See, who knew it was going to come in useful? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> whatever it thought, it did. So anyway, I, I gave up. And then let's see. Uh, culture and change in my own family. Uh, my cousin Verna Mice was my is my first cousin, and she. Uh, so I want to show you how it goes around in the circle. My marine training. This is Verna. She's a marine wife. Her husband was a. Uh, warrant officer and one of my heroes. He's the one that talked me into going into the Marines. And uh, Verna had the bad experience of her husband dying from lung cancer uh, earlier and she wanted to. We all went to the, he was well known. And this is his coffin. Well, here's the parade. Uh, Marines, the dress blue in Arlington Cemetery. Here is the uh, caisson. Here, they had, here, but they had a horse and one take part of the trip. The caisson, and no, no Marine in the saddle. The Marine was dead, and uh, so they had this. And then this was she's going. She's still alive. I talked to her. Every once in a while on the phone, she's going to be buried, I think, here. He's already buried, but they didn't have the grave. And she's going to be buried with him. So she's a Marine Corps wife. Mm -hmm. She had all her medicine taken care of by the Navy Department, because she, and she's a very, very sharp lady. And this is her on uh, Burnham Eyes. And uh, I want to say something about her that betrays, and his, there's a park named after her now in Michigan. This is the park. Mm -hmm. And uh, see if I got the article. I wrote this article. And I wrote four versions of it because when it's, gonna, it's going up on the, on the placard. So 
she did this, and let me just say, Verna Mize, my cousin from the Marines, okay, Verna Mize will forever be remembered as the lady who saved Lake Superior from being polluted by industry. She, ter she termed her 13-year battle a labor of love. She never gave up without funding, without lobbyists, not one. Uh, without demonstrations in the street and signs, or clashes with the law, as a private citizen, defeated a multi-million dollar corporation and moved a lumbering giant in the American government. Uh, where am I at? Uh, to move a lumbering giant to action, governors of three states gave uh, the three Great Lakes states recognized her work, and the American, uh, the Michigan governor, titled her the First Lady of Lake Superior. And when they began the trial, it's the biggest environmental pollution trial in history. And my little cousin, all by herself, did it. So that she proved that you can work within the government and get what you think ought to be done. If you're smart. <laughs> <laughs> Time Magazine came down to interview her one day. And uh, she's outside the Pentagon. That's where she worked. She worked for Admiral Ramsey, among others. But he says, how? Yeah. You. This is you, and this is it. Yeah, yes, I'm the I'm the movement. <laughs> and he says, Well, how do you do that? And he says, Well, she reached in her purse and took out a little vial. And she shook. She said, The water's turned to mud, pollution, with a cancer producing element. She said, I went. She got she got the stuff, bottled it herself. Mac was helping her. <laughs> And then she goes into the Pentagon. She goes into Admiral so and so's office. Hi, Mel. Would you put this as a, wa a weight on your desk? When anybody asks you, you tell them. And the Time reporter said, Well, you got the best source <laughs> to do anything. The executive secretaries of the Pentagon. They're among the most powerful people in the world. Is that crazy? That is. Yeah. So, anyway, she's. Uh, She's in a home now, and she'll probably not pass too much longer. But that's a, a, a wife of a Marine, dedicated to all her values, and she hates Bush and everything, but she loves America. She loves the Marine Corps, and that's what counts. She told me, if Bush won the election, I am going to move to Canada. That's it. <laughs> so after. He won again. I said, Myrna. He said, don't mess with me. <laughs> Are you going to move? No. <laughs> uh, change for group awareness. Yeah. Uh, the thing that uh, I saw in Myrna and in myself and the people that I'm talking about in general is that we were all easily identified by a group, but a different way of looking at a group. And uh, when you would say, well, what's different about the society of 1948 than the society of 2000? Well, the difference is the loss of esprit de corps with a group and the stressing of the rights of individuals. It's now, what are you going to do for me? And Kennedy said, we should not do that, but you know what he was. And so we have a culture of what? Selfishness and undisciplined. But it, as long as it is produced by those people, the Marines will go on, the Army will go on, pilots flying the planes, at O'Hare will go on. Did you ever see when they go on strike how they walk? No. They're on strike, that's right. Got the uniforms on. Airline pilots can go. 
<laughs> They're still remembering what they were taught. Yeah. Yeah, we'll march. Huh? Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Now, to understand Marine, and what I was talking about, just understand that is operating all the time, and most of the people that had a sense of discipline and had a purpose, and uh, I suspect uh, a good family background. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Terrible people can make great things, but it's better if you, <laughs> you got a family in support. So anyway, I thought uh, I might end with that. And then uh, I, I thought that uh, today, when they have three drill instructors, they've had to do that because of this lawyer thing of suing and that, and uh, interest people having rights. I have a right to this. I have a right to that. I don't know where it comes from. I do. But I'm not going to talk right now. So uh, I think, unless you have specific questions, mm -hmm. uh, questions. yeah, I was very proud to be a Marine. Uh, I didn't stay because I had a two-year enlistment, and the alternative was to go, I was offered a scholarship to go to uh, University of Wisconsin for the ROTC, mm -hmm. you know, and that was four years at Wisconsin and then four years commitment. That would be eight years of my life, and I, I would be missing whatever it is that you have to have when you're young to see things you want to do. and so. And I got GI Bill, I went to college. And then. So, where did you go? Aquinas, uh, Loyola, DePaul, Chicago. You know. But what's interesting is this, and this may be a bit sum it up in a sense. I never met a professor who didn't say to me when we got to the point that the very best students we ever had were the veterans of the Second World War. I haven't heard anybody. Now, they're all younger now, but this is, goes back and back and back. They said they were the most disciplined, <laughs> they were hardest working, they were the most generous, and they had no nonsense. They didn't. So do you think that you became a Marine because you were interested in it because of your cousin, cousin, cousin? Do you think that People who well, become, that's a hard question. Though. Become Marines, yeah. You know, is there a? I respected him an awful lot. He was a real John Wayne type of guy. You know, he was so strong. I was visiting him one time, and uh, Verna was went out to dinner. You know, I loved going out with them. We just had more fun. And uh, Verna says. Uh, how much longer can I work in the kitchen? He says, well, I got to see the end of the Lone Ranger. <laughs> That's on television. No, it wasn't. It was on radio. Didn't have television much. And I sat there with him, and we listened to the Lone Ranger. You find me anybody that will say that to anybody, you won't. They're ashamed to think they watch a juvenile program. But you never said anything in Mac. Then he, that happened another time. I, I just thought, well, oh, is this something? People I know, oh, I never watch that stuff. I don't listen to that. And he says, I don't watch The Lone Ranger. And if you don't like it, but you didn't say it. So, <laughs> I said. So you, you joined up right out of high school. Yes, uh, I graduated in 1946, and the draft was still on. It was on for a couple more years. You had right up to Korea. Yeah. And uh, I had to decide whether I was going to join a service. You see, I think maybe you're closer on that question that, uh, than what I said. I would have to do something. I could be drafted, probably. But my uncle said, you ought to join the Marines. Great training and all. Yeah. So I did. So it might have been I was going to be drafted. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. But I knew. Uh, he also said, you know, you can get free college when you go to service. And I got my degree for another degree because of that. 
So I, I suspect it's cloudy. I can't tell you for sure. I think it's because I thought so much of him and he wouldn't mislead me. And I didn't know about that other stuff. You know, I really didn't. So how did you keep in touch with your family? They were in Michigan, you, you were in? Well, they came up to our cottage sometimes and stayed there. Well, when you were in the service, did you did you? Oh, I went back home. You, I went you just for drove, furlough. took the train back and forth? Yeah, you took the train. Uh, first plane ride I had was on Delta, and that was in 40, uh, in 90, uh, no, it was 48. But I took the train, the Gulf, and then we went to Atlanta, we changed. Chicago and took the Milwaukee Road back. And then I got to fly on the weather, the weather plane from Washington to Chicago. Every night before radar and all that stuff, they had a weather plane that ran from Andrews Air Force Base to Chicago. No matter if any other plane was up, this one was up. And they were giving the weather report through the electronics to anybody that wanted it and all the radio stations listen to it and all of that. And all we had, we paid a dollar to get a parachute. And then if we got to Chicago, <laughs> that must have been very we comforting. gave it, we, <laughs> I know. But that, uh, I had so much confidence in the military. You know. And uh, <laughs> when we got here, we flew into Dayton, Ohio, come to think of it. And then they gave us the dollar back. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, good, because you didn't need it. <laughs> So anyway, then I took a train from there to Chicago and Chicago to Upper Michigan. And I only took a couple of furloughs. I was uh, happy with it. I, I would uh, say that uh, if you could get away with all the other junk that has to do with it, a thing they did in the 30s you might be interested in knowing. And you got to remember, I had a different mindset than you young people did. When you were growing up like I was in the 30s, and you did something wrong, and you went before the judge, the judge would say, all right, sir, we got, what can we do to help you grow up here? And, uh, mother lives, all this stuff. He'd say, uh, I know, I'll give it. He had this all the her, sir. So he said, I got two choices here. I can sentence you to uh, two or three years in prison at so and so, he says, or he said, I can sentence you to joining one of the services for a couple of years. Everybody took the service because they were still free. You couldn't do that, could you? They had a choice. And they all took to go up to the Navy, and some liked it. Some hated it. Some ran away, I suppose. I do a look on that. But uh, that's uh, a significant change from group group to individual interests, from responsibilities and that to not caring and wanting your rights. I think that's the biggest change that happened. And it's uh, probably hardest on the people least prepared to deal with it. You know. So did you, um did you, having experience in the military, did it change your opinion about anything about the military, about war in general? It reinforced all my values, and I found out that uh, discipline isn't a dirty word, and uh, that those people were very, very. See, I was in a, a lot of music and bands I used to play in. I had my own, and uh, boy, it's a different lifestyle. And uh, I was able to see that these middle class people, well, you know that, for example, the, the college people I mean, do their share of helping the country. You can read the studies on it. The two people went to, that went to MIT. MIT went into the Army, mm -hmm. six of these. And so I met another, what would you say, type of alternative lifestyle that is was different but it was not threatening I, as a matter of fact I the music people threatened me more in their lifestyle than the Marines did one left you alone the other always wanted you to sink down with them you know so uh, I can't say that it would happen for everybody like people washed out all the time 
But do you ever study when you were in college the Gaussian curve, mm -hmm. standard curve of deviation? Mm -hmm. uh, and then the standard curve of deviation is a, most of whatever is whatever, 64%, IQ, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And uh, I grew up in a little mining town. And I had a wonderful mother who was the happiest person. I had never knew. I never saw anybody happier than her. And I grew up in the real value center here. But we weren't over here. And the Marines helped me go from a mining company environment like Pennsylvania people who have a coal to get out of. And I ended up here. But I found they got more problems and, and a tougher road to hoe because other people expect them to do these things. These people, they don't expect to do anything. So you, you, you wrestle with that. And I think all of that, Kathy, can work together. And uh, because I joined the Marines and I got to say, the thing that I had was my background that my dad and mother gave me. And uh, see, my first hero was a member of Charlemagne's rear guard that protected the major army. And uh, I read that story over and over again. And then my dad gave me a book, a series of seven books. It's called The Great Source. No, The Great War Source Book. You don't have it in this library. Hardly anybody has it. And, uh, seven volumes and my dad had my name engraved in it and it said to Paul my young son uh, in memory of our our oh our gift of living in America and that's it, yeah. but I started to read and this is one of the stories that in every battle in the First World War, the highest ranking officer wrote what he thought it was. The highest ranking Axis, usually a German, wrote his side of it, and a neutral Swiss, uh, Swedish, who wasn't a participant, wrote a third. And I learned to, and I'm really I'm saying I really learned to appreciate this, and then that, and then the third one was usually the weakest, because he didn't have his heart and soul into it. So I found out the perfect mixture is not just intelligence, it's intelligence with the feelings that drive the intelligence. So I thought that was interesting. Son, my, my oldest son works in uh, the defense industry. I tech, uh, very secretive. And he was at a meeting, and the people couldn't get over, he was fairly young, how he didn't get upset, like in the movies. All of that. But he has a right to accept the world. A right to be nasty is not a moral obligation, <laughs> right? So anyway, he had to go back and prepare for the next day with the, all the people that came. And so he didn't go out to dinner, but the people who were out for dinner were talking about him. I said, how can, how can you really take that to God? He said, well, you know, his dad is a philosopher, and he, he gave him this book on Marcus Aurelius, and he says he learned it. No. Marcus Aurelius was a Stoic. Mm -hmm. He was the highest ranked, good emperor of the decrepit Roman Empire. 